what we will do, uh, you know, with this uh, very uh, experienced and, uh, you know, diverse panel is that we'll ask them to share their learnings, their insights, and advice on the topic of hyper-personalization. Uh, the way that we've set up the discussion is that we'll talk about the what, the why, and the how. In terms of what, you know, we do realize that this is about, you know, giving unique products, benefits, experiences to your consumers. But let's understand from the panel as to how are they pushing the boundaries on that, you know, today and in the future. In terms of the why, you know, research after research, you know, and from the stuff that we've done at Bain as well, consumers absolutely love, you know, hyper-personalization. Who wouldn't, right? But, you know, and then the case for, uh, you know, doing that is pretty clear. At least in the US, whether it's a Target, it's a Macy's, people are seeing pretty significant uplift in revenue. Would love to explore with the panel as to how are they seeing it in their businesses or seeing it in their clients' businesses. And finally on how, you know, I would love to engage with the panel to understand how does technology help us drive personalization at scale and, you know, really understand from the operators as to what are the success factors for driving successful you know, personalization. So those are the kind of topics that, you know, we will cover over the next, uh, uh, you know, time that we have. So without much ado, let me, you know, set up uh, the discussion. And we'll start with understanding, you know, what is it that different retailers are doing. Now, we do know that consumers today are, you know, spoiled for choice. But again, a lot of our research shows that, you know, consumers really crave clarity and simplicity in some senses helping you know, asking for retailers to actually guide them towards their right choices. And again, that may be something that you've experienced or you think otherwise. Uh, so from a personalization or a hyper-personalization perspective, what are the two or three most profound ways that you're driving personalization in your business? Uh, this could be at the store, this could be for other touch points or episodes, but would just love to hear how you're doing this, you know, in the most important ways. If, if, a, if a few of you can also touch upon what you think is par for the course today versus what is truly differentiated. I mean, you know, Ramnik, I know the conversation that we were having in the lounge about your fan once. Again, would love to get, you know, learnings and insights from there. But why don't I kick off with this question and, you know, Tushar, if you could, you know, start off, that'd be great. Uh, thank you, Jwadi. Uh Personalization, uh, uh, it is, uh, the market has changed over the last uh, 10, uh, 10, 20, 30 years. There was a time when people would wear the same khaki and the same white shirt, and that was the marketing done by international brands, and everybody would look like they have come out from the military or they're just wearing the same thing. Everybody's in a denim and a white shirt or khaki and a white shirt. That all has changed. Uh, consumers today have become more aware. I think the Instagram and the social media has made them uh, more aware, more conscious, they want to be more, uh, people want to be different and, you know, show off their style. Who am I? What am I? I'm different from you. I'm not the same breed. We are not all wearing the same clothes. And you'll see that across. There'll be people with purple hair and there'll be people with green hair and, uh, you know, and different kind of clothes, right? That's individual. That's what's creating this personalization think that if I come to a store, how am I different or what am I wearing different from the other people? And a uh, few examples, uh, small things that uh, we have done and I believe this will go further. One, one thing that has happened is in, in the stores, the new technology, 3D technology has come in and we are experimenting with that in our office. We are still not implementing in the stores. But in the stores, what we have done with the handbags and footwear, uh, we have events where you can come in you can select your handwear and footwear and it customizes or the artist will paint something about you or for you or stitch it for you on that product, right? And it happens in the t-shirts also. We have done that on t-shirts. When you come in the store, I will put your name, your logo or your, it's like putting a tattoo, right? Why do you have tattoos? It's, it's personalized. Same thing you want on the product or what you're wearing. So I think that's, that the market is changing. Another thing I will, I will quickly share before I pass on is, even in stores during Raksha Bandhan, uh, personalizing gifts. You would come in the store, pick something up, and we'll say, you know, we can do a ribbon with your sister's name or brother's name on it, 
and that will be personalized, personalized ribbon. The product can be the same, but it can be personalized with, with the packaging. Thank you. Yeah, no, uh, so I agree with the, what, you, what you said. Right now, uh, we all remember, you know, the standard norm was the black rectangle glasses that almost everywhere wear. Now we have popping colors, different uh, engraving, etc. going on. So what that leads to is a, almost an inherent need in this uh, market of abundance to direct the consumer to the right product. And for us, being an omni-channel player, the most important thing was that the journey does not break as the person is transversing between online, offline, or at their home experiences. So a typical journey for lens card consumer is that they get to know about us from their friends, family, they download the app, they try different products out. At some point, we nudge them to do their face scan. Uh, and typically, we do that to ask them to help them in uh, getting to the right size of glasses that will fit them well. But when we are doing the face scan, it allows us to take several data points on their facial features, which allows us to then recommend glasses to them. Now, while that part of the journey is taken care of, the second challenge for us was that when that customer goes to the store, they again are flooded with a lot of choices and have to redo their journey. So that's when we introduced a lot of iPads in our stores. And as soon as, a, uh, as, soon as the customer enters the store now, uh, the person gets their name, they know what kind of glasses they like, what kind of glasses have they browsed, what have they shortlisted, what have they bought in the past. And that allows us to continue the journey both online and offline for our consumers. And I think that will end up being the norm as we move forward. Because uh, like you said, the merchandise is all over the place. It, people are getting hyper, uh, you know, personalized choices which uh, they are looking for. And it is now our job, our owners to make sure that we direct them to the right product for them. Gul? Uh, so, uh, Ramnik, a very interesting point, right? You actually get a lot of data of the consumer once they go for the trial. And I think that's what I will agree with both of you is the consumer is evolving, the aspirations are growing, and hence there is much more need to understand the consumer. And I think any type of personalization starts with the understanding of the consumer. And how technology is helping is a great example of that. And not, so you have more and more tools to understand the consumer and then basis the requirement of the consumer, you can personalize. But what I personally believe is like personalization can be at scale also. See, because, uh, you know, it's a great example that you can have uh, your brother's name or sister's name, but there are a set of consumers who want the personalization at scale. So what we realized when we were not looking at the consumers but the shoppers, the way they enter into the store and what they want to know and what they don't want to know, we realized that there are a set of people who want guidance and there are a set of people who don't need guidance, right? They just want them to be left alone and explore. Why? Because there were two things which were coming very, very clearly. Few of them were finding it very, very, I would say, intriguing in terms of people coming and asking what do you want and some were feeling awkward because they were just exploring and they didn't want it to make a decision at that point of time. Uh, we at Philips, we realized that this is a great opportunity because it's a challenge but that's as well. So we introduced a small, a very, very small in initiative on our stores saying, you know, there is a QR code next to the product. You just scan that QR code and you get a two minutes demonstration on your phone. So it's completely left to the consumer saying, you know, what do you want to explore? And this is what I believe tech is helping in terms of getting personalization at scale also. And that's why understanding the consumer and then using the tech for both understanding and providing solution is something that I see as a way forward and very, very uh, a must for every brand today. Thank you. Fantastic example. So, you know, things that I'm picking up, obviously starting with an understanding of the consumer or the shopper and the journey. I heard the things about making it seamless or frictionless, uh, you know, doing a number of things around it's an occasion. In some senses, you can, you know, guide that, uh, you know, the consumer to the specifics of the choices that, you know, she's uh, making. Sanjay, from your perspective, you know, given the premium brand uh, that you do, how do you see hyper-personalization, you know, playing to differentiate your brand? You know, we were talking earlier about, you know, uh, one of the first Indian brands versus a number of, you know, MNC brands that you're up against. How does personalization drive, you know, your brand relevance and differentiation? So, my take on this whole thing is that uh, when we talk about hyper-personalization, 
normally it's kind of taken from a very uh, close up view you know we kind of zero in with respect to becoming as good or as synonymous as probably custom made you know but i would like to kind of take a few steps back and see how does this work from creating a solution or probably an offering for your consumers as a larger business standpoint you know so if i go back and see where how spiker started i see myself having hyper personalized it at that point of time 30 years back where uh, we are a boutique brand meant only to serve consumers for their jeans and their jeans wear needs so from that perspective from the entire wardrobe i am actually hyper personalizing it to that extent and when we started off we kind of looked at a very niche audience within the niche which is talking about denims and fashioning denims so not just your basic five pockets we went further a few steps and dug into it and said that let's create a fashion denim on the canvas which is a denim and so we became so so niche in that seg in that segment that for me the business actually was about hyper personalizing and creating and crafting a consumer from a very large universe and making products only for that set of customers and so as a brand i think all of us have kind of created our own segments and niches that we address uh and rightly said by uh, you know goal that uh there are there are ma many ways to look at uh, personalizing uh, other than you know seeing it from very micro and a very uh, sharp perspective uh, we've kind of attempted that now once you enter the store you enter the store because you are entering a denim store and hence consumer expects everything that's there in denim to be there at the store and so i need to be a little more wider compared to probably what you'll find at zara or an h&m so yes uh, the customers need for a pair of jeans will be better served at a spiker but a customers need of a garment may be better served at a zara so this is where we see that when you kind of create these sharper segments of audiences i also see that as being a step towards hyper personalizing your business and your offering to your towards a customer once i have the customer in the store i then need to be a little more broader in the terms of my offering and then uh, the sales guys at the store then leads you to a probably a product which makes more sense for you as a body or a torso or a mindset so i think uh, that comes with training a lot our, our our people at the store but otherwise we look at it from a very uh you know we see from a very distant perspective uh we haven't yet gone into it from a very sharp and the current uh, how how today's people look at hyper person we are not really uh, put our steps ahead on that uh, also i think because we are a boutique brand it's going to be a little difficult for us to make it a little more sharper than what we are today got it got it sanjay uh, and and before i lose the thread ramni can go i do want to come back to you you know subsequently as to you know given what you are doing you know what you know metrics or outcomes you're seeing but i'll come back to that you know when we talk about some of the how part uh, i heard two different things right sanjay you're saying keeping at a distance but pretty much my entire business model is around you know some degree of you know personalization similarly you know what i heard you tushar saying the different ways that i'm using it for the different categories and brands uh, you know that are retailing and i heard the strains of saying understand personalization the big challenge you know as gul was saying how do we do this at scale and that's that that's a you know very very real trade off you know you can be intimate and there's always a seeming trade off you know versus scale and and i guess the the, the challenge is how do we actually address that trade off you know through technology through innovations through changes in business models so would love to pull you in aditi and apurv and a couple of others to see how have you seen uh how clients how retailers have addressed this intimacy at scale uh you know opportunity thanks radeep um i think uh, what we are seeing increasingly is you know consumers across the board not just internationally but also in india there's a very strong sense of individuality and there's a very strong sense of wanting to express themselves and that has led to a lot of retailers banking on these two factors and creating th the need for hyper personalization really started from there and i wanted to share the story of loreal loreal is one of uh, salesforce's largest customers 
And you know, women in the audience or whoever identifies as women, those who use lipstick would know that, you know, finding that perfect shade of lipstick is always extremely tough. You, you walk into a retailer, you will always find a shade that's just right. You will never find the accurate shade. And L'Oreal, from his years of research and interaction with the customer, they realized that this was a problem. Customers and women really want a very personalized, correct shade of lipstick. So they created this amazing device. You should all go and check it out or ask your wives to check it out. It's called, uh, it's uh, YSL Rouge Sur Mesure. I don't speak French, so I don't know if I've pronounced it right. But what that device does is that it works only with a mobile app. The mobile app has three things. One, it can pick from hundreds of shades. Uh, the customer can pick from hundreds of shades. Or it can, number two, you can point at a particular shade and ask uh, and give it to the device. Or third, you can take a picture of your outfit and ask the device to match the sh right shade. Now, the magic begins after that. The device actually creates that lipstick shade and gives it to you right then and there. So it's not just personalizing, but it's also giving you instant gratification. Now, this technology is powered by multiple things, right? One is for the consumer, they've got instant gratification, they, wa they got what they wanted. But think about it from L'Oreal. Like Ramnik was pointing out, by taking the pictures, they're collecting hundreds of attributes about the customer, and they're leveraging all these attributes to then personalize their next nudge, which is, you know, maybe your skincare. This is what you want from the skincare. These are the brands that you can take from skincare. I think by combining, hyper-personalization is not just restricted to one channel. The channels are evolving, and the retailers, and all across the industries, we have to start thinking about customer journeys and customers' aspirations and start designing our hyper-personalization journeys. Kapoor? Hi, first of all, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, absolutely great to hear some perspective. I think I'm very happy representing Aditi and me. We are the technology, we are the enablers. So very happy to hear technology everywhere. I think uh, the way I see it is, I'm going to give two examples before I do that. Uh, the way I see it is that, you know, very relevant, right? The Who's the customer today? The customer today is basically who's always on their mobile phones. We live in the world of five, ten minute Instagram reels. There is no attention span. No one anymore looks at billboards. No one has the patience to even look at uh, ads anymore, right? How do you acquire this sort of a customer with low attention span? And this customer, by the way, is spoiled with so many choices. Now, whichever category you go to, you pretty have 15, 20 brands, both Indian and international, competing in that category at different price points also. Now, no attention, multiple offerings, different price points. How do you sell to such a customer? Hence comes in personalization. All of these guys also expect us to offer one-to-one -one level of personalization, which means, hey, you know what? If Spygar is a brand and they have, let's say, a couple of millions of customers, every customer wants to have a personalized experience. So which means Spiker now has to cater to millions of personalized experience, and which is not possible, which brings in technology, right? This is how we fit in technology. We fit in AI, automation, so many other things, right? And which is where, you know, we are a marketing automation CDB plan, uh, brand and we come into some of these places. Now bring this back in, right? What I mean by one-to-one -one personalization and I con concur with knowing more about the customer, right? And thankfully we live in a space uh, and I'll bring in two elements, right? One is of omni-channel experiences, right? Because we're talking about customer experience. Customer doesn't care, uh, uh, you know, uh, whether... Uh, you know, online, offline, and to be irrespective of how much online you talk, 70, 80% of your customer is buying offline. That's the reality. And what I'm trying to say is that it has to be an omni-channel, seamless customer experience. And then you work backwards, which starts with knowing more about the customer. Now, coming to two sort of smart nuances from our customers, right? Carrot Lane, one of a very cool brands that I feel into jewelry, right? They had this problem that, uh, you know, we sell sort of a ring to anybody or any jewelry, no one's going to come in next six months to buy. No one's going to come in a year to buy. Most customers won't, right? While they are obviously not in premium plus plus, but they're up to premium and lower categories of sorts, right? Now, they very interestingly did a very smart thing. They said, you know what? Every six months, I will reach out to my customer and call them to my store for my cleaning of jewelry, free of cost. I will communicate this by my loyalty 
sort of program engine. And every time that comes in, they do by while buying, take your number, um, you know, email address, or probably the nearest store location and all that. By this means, I will call you the moment, and I'll not charge you anything for it. So you're in my store, my half of my job is done overall, right? So your engagement and communication is online, which is by email, SMS, or some other medium. But the eventual buying can happen. Some of this becomes the funnel and you convert via this. But a very personalized experience, right? I'm calling you free of cost to wash your jewelry and everybody wants to wash their jewelry every six months to a year, right? So even if you didn't come in a six month, you'd come in a year to say, and there's no charge for you, right? So good, good low CAC investment of sorts. Last pointer, right, and um, in interest of time, is this brand um, where, um, you know, um, like everybody likes personalized experiences. And IKEA does a great job at it. Another customer that we have, you know. What IKEA did was very, and it's now I think pretty widely understood, is that you have an app. With that app, I can click a photo of a furniture. And in a 3D sort of a nuance, I can see how it looks like in a perspective 10 by 10 room or some other room with a certain wall for me to visualize my furniture. I'm sure most of you have gone to a buy furniture. And it's very hard to imagine sort of how would it, this furniture look in my sort of an apartment, my sort of a room, right? So they did this, right? A small click of photo of that furniture or you putting some nuances gave you the visualization. Coming back, I think this is what personalization for me. A bit of it is understanding your consumer, then trying to tailor make your product and service and offering sort of an experience. Back oh, at you. God. No, that, that's great. And as I'm hearing you saying, and I think this is where Tushar also started out, start with the consumer, recognize the need for expressiveness, and then, you know, that's, that's how, you know, you think about this across all your channels. Continuing down that theme, you know, uh, uh, and, and Ramnik asking you, we talked about the try-on uh, technology that you had. What were some of the big watch-outs or challenges that you faced as you implemented it at scale? Would love to hear that, because you said it was, you know, initially on the app, then you took the iPads and put it, but what were the real big challenges that you had? I think uh, the first thing that one has to be very careful about is that uh, being technologist, we have this uh, urge to bring the technology at the forefront when the way the experience needs to be designed is that it actually decomplexifies the experience for customer. Customer should not even realize that there is personalization going on. Uh, so I think that was a learning for us. We spoke uh, too much about the technology while doing the try-on online, and it uh, it uh, sort of also tried to you know uncover the engine which was running behind it, and it uh, it can creep people out. So what you need to do is you need to make sure that you know all of that uh, you know engineering brilliance that you are trying to put in is on the back end. Customer doesn't even realize, but what you see is that you try to monitor, and eventually that should lead to more you know essentially bias. That is the ultimate goal of it. So that is, I would say, is a key watch out to keep, to make it extremely simple for consumer, go back to the basics and get them the right product and measure it via the purchases that they're doing rather than any other vanity metric. Great insight about actually making it oblivious uh, to, the, to the shopper. Tushar, on the other hand, in some senses, let's say what I heard you say about the personalization that you do is actually to make it you know, obvious and apparent to the consumer, right? How do you, you know, ex you know, execute that at scale with consistency across the networks that you have? Would love to again hear what, as we think about personalization, but driving it across a large network or across a large business, what are one or two kind of big watchouts? Uh, the most important thing is the mindset, right? First, you have to believe it can happen, and we have to do it, and we don't have choice. And. Uh, Things, things change when, uh, when you see that the market, okay, let me put it this way. You don't have to be the first adopter of technology. You can be the second or the third one, but execute it better. I think execution, mindset of the teams to adopt that. Right? Any new technology that comes in, first the mindset that it's not working or it's too early. Also, how do you market it? What are you going to market this as? Right? And... I, I would find it easier to start a new brand with personalization than, than to adopt it in an existing brand. It's very difficult to adopt in an existing brand because you change the systems, change the mindset, change the vision. Right? Here you, you are saying, I have a new brand, I have a new product, 
and I'm doing this in a new way. And I'll give you an example as an apparel group Dubai has a digital store, which is very different with digital and retail combined. So when you go in the store, there are no products. There's nothing in the store. There's only iPads in the store. You sit there, you, you select what you want. You can go in in the trial room and there's an automatic wardrobe and the products are there. So that's one thing that I've seen. I've seen another thing, a Victoria's Secret store of the future. Uh, when we went to visit, you go in the trial room and you hang the clothes and they have an RFID technology that will read what is there and tell you on the screen, there's a screen inside the trial room, this product is available in this sizes, it's not available, it's available in the store or it's available online and you can press a bell and the, the, and the, and the helper or the, uh, the sales staff will bring the other product to you if it's in the store. So these are things that adoption of technology and the mindset is the biggest, biggest thing you have to face. Consumers are willing to experiment but your sales team has to be convinced to tell them this is good, please try it out. Thank you. Fantastic. Continuing on that theme, because the, you know, it's a great segue into you know, saying how do we actually you know, execute this well. Again, a lot of our, uh, you know, the research at Bain shows that it, the consumer case for change is clear. You know, retailers and CEOs absolutely put it at the top of their agenda. But you know, more than 50, 60 percent of such initiatives tend to falter if not fail. Uh, and therefore, I would love to kind of you know understand from you as to you know what are the again the big shifts that you have to do, whether it's in your know, business model. And Tusha, great point about whether to do it <laughs> with a completely de novo setup versus doing with an exit. So that's that's got some you know thought process taking. Big shifts in your business model and or your operating model. We've again seen clarity on objectives, having the right metrics, the right capabilities. You know, that's what helps build, build the connection between technology and the consumer. Uh, but Sanjay, back to you. And I, and I know the perspective that you're coming from, but the way that I took away is that, you know, pretty much I can look at your entire business <laughs> as running on that. So what, you know, Sanjay, would be the two or three big things that you have done, uh, and you said 30 years I've been doing this, but even given the pace of consumer change, competitor changes, what are the big things that you have to do to make sure that this personalization at scale can be executed successfully? So I'll probably give one example that we've done towards this whole cause. Uh, and rightly said by Tushar, a lot of changes can't happen in legacy businesses, you know, so uh, a lot needs to change and that probably puts a lot of other things at risk as well. So from that perspective, uh, e-commerce is quite large in our kind of business and players like Mintra and Ajio are really working pretty hard to kind of uh, see to it that data brings them so much of, uh, uh, you know, information that they can actually go and personalize a lot of products for their consumers. So what we've done is one effort with Amazon and one with Mintra where we created special lines which are actually, uh, you know, right from designing to the entire option plan, uh, right to the entire merchandise assortment is brought across by, uh, you know, using data and their tech to kind of create a whole collection which uh, eventually speaks to a very targeted audience. You know, and to the extent that uh, we have zeroed in to a very, very small niche, uh, uh, and right now we are talking about a line which is more on the streetwear, where they have, we have kind of come together and created a whole collection which is meant for kids from 13 years to 20 year old, and specifically for their streetwear requirement. And this is where I think uh, partnerships evolve, and players like us who have been um, how do I put it, more conventional in their approach, uh, and because it's a 30-year-old brand, we've kind of partnered with people who are at the cutting edge on technology and created, at the end of the day, we need to bring the offering to the customer. So the ways can probably be, be very different, whether you do it completely in-house or you partner with somebody, but yes, you are leveraging technology, you're leveraging this whole uh, uh, asset that we kind of create out of personalizing things, uh, through mechanisms which are probably better suited with the partners. And we are at the cusp of launching that line. Uh, I think uh, 
in June, end or July, we are going to start that. Uh, we, are launch, we are launching the streetwear collection. And I'm kind of looking forward to how, how it does exactly. Uh, I'm fairly certain that it should be good. Great. So I'm picking up a test and learn kind of mentality and experimentation thing, partnerships, and therefore, you know, benefit from the ecosystem that's there. Gul, if I can turn to you, and you know, just, not just picking up on the example of the QR codes that you, that you gave, but again, how do you define, you know, if you do the objectives around personalization that your business should have, who should be on point, how should they be running it? Any kind of changes in the in your in your business and your operating model to make this successful? Uh, I think more than the change, I think clarity is more important. Okay, and I give you an example of our organization. So we have we used to have two units. One was completely B two B because we are in healthcare, where we are selling MRI machines and you know uh, to hospitals. And on the other hand, you know we have our retail business, which is selling a mixer grinder. Now two different businesses, right? But two teams. Now, my healthcare team understands customer. They don't understand consumer. Okay. And we realize that within the organization, we need to make it very clear that there is a difference between a customer and a, and a consumer. Right? And I'm, this clarity was important because what happens is the business which is big normally overshadows other businesses. And then you know, the entire organization starts talking the language of a customer or a, or a consumer. And then there is this actual I would say conflict within. Now, of course, then there are shoppers and all, and I will not go into that detail. But taking that example, uh, you know, and uh, our appliances business, we have a core category as mixer grinder. Now, when I say mixer grinder, your kitchen stops without mixer grinder. But if you look at the engagement or the attention that you pay to the choice of mixer grinder, is not that high because you are quite comfortable with that appliance. You know as if like you know it all, you don't. At the same time, there are smaller nuances that the consumer always keeps bringing up. So we have introduced recently uh, one of the mixer grinders which doesn't make noise because this was one of the, uh, I would say, uh, insights coming from the consumer that morning 7 o'clock, once the mixer grinder starts operating, then you don't need an alarm bell, right? So uh, that works. So I said, okay, then it serves two, two purposes. They said, no, it's not needed. We have alarm bell. Okay, fair. So we introduced our, uh, uh, you know, simply silent uh, mixer grinder. Our challenge was uh, how to reach it to the consumers. And, uh, you know, that's where actually a lot of insights that we were collecting while we were understanding the consumers and trying to do something on a, on a personalization level, we realized that this is something new. It would be difficult for us to reach out to all the consumers, and you know we were we otherwise was was planning to make an offer, and there we were trying for a gamification sort of a thing to uh, you know attract the consumers. We used the insight from personalization that we were to actually give a demonstration on uh, you know a simply silent. So we we created a gam gamification app for the stores where you can go and you can actually use that app to see how a normal mixer grinder works and how a simply silent mixer mixer grinder works so it is not necessary that you know what you are doing when you are trying to understand consumers on a personalized is you know cannot be used anywhere else so this is one example the second one is a pure personalization and and that's where i just have to say something when i when i always read hyper personalization i get a little confused because for me there is nothing called hyper personalization there is only personalization and that's what first thing comes to me as, as personalization. We cannot get hyper. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, you know, another example in this category was we realized that consumers do want different colors on their mixer grinders, but they are confused. Consumer do wants to customize their mix, mixer grinders. They don't want all the five jars or three jars and all. So recently we have started something which is personalization at scale that you can come to our page, you can Customize your own mixer grinder. So take the mixer grinder. These are the colors available. Choose the color, choose the uh, jars, and then we will deliver it to your home. Or you can go to our store, see the colors on your own, see the jars on your own, customize it there, give the order there, and we will deliver it to your home. So I think for me, personalization I personally believe is simple and we have to keep it simple in that way. 
instead of always looking at something to innovate. See, technology is there to help us, and innovation is hap happening at the technology level. How we use that to understand the consumer and create our pro proposition is the change, you can say, that, that we have brought in terms of our mindset. Very quick follow-up. I mean, Gul, therefore, do you, I'm, I'm just wondering, let's say from a metrics perspective, what do you do? I mean, you treat this as, let's say, a balance sheet asset, and therefore, you know, the metrics could be quite different versus saying PNL, I've got to see impact. Would just love to, I mean, <laughs> see, any thoughts on, you know, how you would do that? At this moment, I look at personalization more from an NPS asset. NPS and consumer yeah. retention. See, because uh, if my NPS is improving, my balance sheet will improve. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think personalization for me, at least in our industry, is at that level that it can help actually help you improve your NPS. Yeah. No, no, I know. And Philips has always been a pioneer in, in, in using NPS. Com completely get that. Aditi, quick thoughts on what you've seen clients change in their operating model, you know, capability changes. Because whatever Gul said needs actually a very different supply chain, you know, both at the back end and, you know, to the cu customer as well. What are, you know, where do you see your clients? finding, you know, things tough to change in terms of a business or an operating model? Sure. Uh, I will look at your silent mixer. I think we definitely no, need... I've got all so many recommendations from saying, calls. starting with no khaki, <laughs> no white, get the right colored, you know, spectacle frames. And Lots of new stuff to buy. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Then we are doing our job right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we've worked with clients for many years now, over 20 years, and I think... Um, what we have heard constantly, and this is what we also advise a client, I'm sure Bain does that as well, is when you're t undertaking a journey of transformation, whether today it's hyper-personalization, yes, tears, it was AR, VR, tomorrow it may be Gen AI, but I think we have to understand when there's a transformation journey, it's as important to know what to stop doing uh, as it is important to know what to start doing. Uh, and I think transformation, the customers of ours who have, who have taken transformation as a journey, and not a point in time activity, they have been the one who have been most successful. So we have to understand that such kind of transformation, the innovation keeps constantly coming in. And you have to be prepared that when you are undertaking such journeys, you have to constantly find uh, room in your PNL to find that budget to keep investing on it constantly. It cannot just be that you have invested once and it stops because tomorrow something new may crop up and personalization to hyper-personalization can become something completely different. So I think that's what we have seen has made the difference between success and failure of organizations who are taking transformation. Great, great point. Tushar, quick bite on that. I mean, given your experience, you know, building your group, et cetera, I mean, how do you suggest other retailers look at these efforts? What should they, you know, think about as the difficult ones of, you know, learning from your, uh, you know, experience? See, if you're talking about where to put it in the PNL, I think uh, for us, it is experimenting, learning about the customer, what is going to happen next. We don't want to be caught off guard saying this technology or this new things have come in and we as a retailer are left behind. Right? So it is very important to invest. Uh, I don't think a PNL, but invest in the customer retention, experimenting, figuring out what next, what's the new technology, what's going on, and and I can I can tell you as you know, there were there were times uh, 10, 15 years back when you'd go more deep in the product, so you'd buy thousands of each because everybody is wearing the same shoes, same thing. Now we go more wide. Right? So you go more wide, but there is investment in that. There'll be people not buying certain products. So I think you just have to be ready to experiment. And experimentation every year. And you can't stop, you can't say, it's like growing. The, the only thing that can grow is keep learning, keep educating yourself, keep aware what's happening. If somebody else is doing it, can I experiment? I'll give you a quick example. We started in 2000, I can't remember the year, maybe 2007, 2008, a loyalty program called Club Apparel. And the tagline was, no uh, cards, only rewards. Everybody was issuing cards. Uh, we were saying, bring your mobile. And we had a device which had the modem sound. And you put on it, and you'll get the points, or you can redeem your points. We were very early. That technology was actually used for payment, like Apple Pay, but nobody adopted it. 
We took it, experimented, and we became very successful. I think experimenting continuously is important. I can always thank Tushar for bringing me the, you know, the right segue into the next question, which is really, you know, the last question I'll turn to is, therefore, given what he said about continuing to experiment, keeping yourself open to that, would love to hear what does the future hold? you know, for personalization. I will refrain from using hypergul. Uh, Apoor, what does the future hold? The two big things that you would, you know, outline for the audience. I wish I knew the future, but I had implemented for myself, but uh, I'll try my best. Uh, I think I kind of conquer with a lot of things that have been said by, you know, some of these guys are brilliant business leaders, they build large businesses. We have large customers, large format stores, small format stores and everything. I think what we need to first understand primarily, personalization is an enabler, nothing more. I think in this whole piece of trying to personalize experiences, we are tending to cross and become gimmicky. That's the word, right? Your experiences can't go bad. It's all about your customer, point number one. So that, in my opinion, is very important to understand and know for today. Point number two, I think, is in terms of these experiences, right? I'll come back and from hyper-personalization, not being hyper, I'll come back to the fact that we are ultimately looking at customer experience and personalization is a sub-element of that customer experience, which means the customer is at the center. And then whether it be your product, which is changing or being personalized, or the experience, with technology and some other things being personalized, it's very important to sort of understand that, not sway away from this of sorts. So coming with AI, chat, GPT, some of these technologies will come, go, some will evolve, some will die. Um, it's very important to understand what are you doing, who are you doing it for, and what is the end outcome. And the way I see this as the integration that's the future, right, in my opinion. The integration of online and offline, the omni-channel experience will go much better. And it's already happening. For example, a lot of people discover your product and service today online, but they buy offline, you know? Like, you know, there are experiences where I can actually book and pay for a product online, but go to the store and collect it, right? So, you know, this integration, in my opinion, is the real future. It is already being seen. And the last element of this is, I think, try and understand that we're living in a place where the attention span is very low. I come back to this, right? So how can you make the customer's buying experience more focused on helping them make smarter choices will deliver a customer experience? For example, if you already know my shopping pattern and behavior, when I enter your store, can your salesperson or the you know shopping elements around point me to the 10 things that I'm more sort of uh, focused on buying. I think some of these elements will take over our buying experiences because, you know, we are, we are going from 10 to 5 minute sort of uh, reels to probably 2 minute attention spans. That's what the world looks like. So for me, I think that's the future. And I guess there's always this, you know, this trade-off between uh, being predictive, which is very, very tough versus being adaptive, right? Okay, and you know, given the attention span the, and for the time of we have, you know, five more minutes that we need to hold our audience's attention for. So what I'm going to do, starting with Sanjay and down the panel, you know, final thoughts, one piece of advice, how you want to do it, but you know, a short bite on, uh, you know, what you want to leave the audience with. And then, you know, time permitting, you know, I'll die, I, I will not try and do a nice summary of this because it's impossible. But we'll see if we have time for a couple of uh, questions from the audience. So I think for me, the future holds a lot of uh, information which comes through the data that I collect. And India being what it is, and it's at the cusp of really great, great things. I think uh, for a brand like ours as well, we see many Indias coming through over here. And we will, and we will surely want to uh, create very personalized product offering for region specific and for cohorts which are specific. So I think uh, eventually, uh, uh, I think uh, the way we kind of collect data and we use data to kind of create the right kind of assortments and mix 
uh, will become a lot more profound and a lot more important in times uh, ahead of us. So I see uh, to what Ramnik said that uh, there would be a lot of personalization, but it will not be in your face. It will be there uh, at the back end uh, to create much more sharper offerings and uh, interesting products for our customers. Thanks, Ajay. Apoor, final thought? Yeah, so I, you stole my point. I think it's going to be a lot about data. And, uh, you know, um, it's largely going to be about understanding your end customer to, you know, demographics, to behavior, to, you know, Ramnik said about how we can get a facial scan and figure things out in product development and so on and so forth. That's one aspect. And the second piece is the seamless integration of these data points and perspectives across your customer journeys, across your touch points. It has to be seamless. It, customer, and, and, you know, I think Ramnik or someone else said that, they should not feel you're trying to do personalization. It should feel like you're having an experience and how and what is not very important. It's that you should feel good about that experience. I think that's what, in my opinion, will be the focus. Um, I think the most important thing is to put your customer, whether it's your consumer or it's your end customer, um, consumer or your customer in between them, you have to put them in the center of your entire thinking and designing and strategizing because once you do that, then you have more flexibility to bring in newer technologies and innovations in the process. So my key advice and takeaway would be, how do you design your business around your customer and not around your product or your solution or your service? And we need to have more women on panels and across the board. Completely agree with you. <laughs> I think uh, I have two learnings even from today's panel discussion. One, uh, follow the consumer on personalization blindly and follow them, okay? take their advice. Uh, second, keep provisions in your p &L because whenever they will ask you for change, it will require provision, I would say resources to follow what they are saying. So this is the two things that I see on personalization. Yeah, I think the key takeaway is that uh, with AI becoming big, uh, the important thing for all of us to note over here is now we have an ability to process large data sets. That is the key takeaway. All the news around, you know, Amazon, Google, etc. will go away because eventually all the algorithms will get commoditized. They will be available as a service and everyone will be able to use it. The key differentiator will be each and every business sitting here, whatever data set they have, that will be the secret sauce, that will be the differentiator between the outcomes of those algorithms. So whatever information you are able to collect, capture, you should try to do that, keeping your consumer's uh, privacy in mind, keep it in an anonymized form, but definitely collect a lot of data because you will find use for it eventually. Uh, customer is a king or queen. Um, most uh, important thing decide who is your customer and who's who's not your customer. Uh, you will not be able to cater to everybody. You will have to decide who is your customer who is not your customer. Second is experiment. Third is be adoptive. You will have to adopt, change, figure out because your customers are evolving and you will have to evolve with them. Thank you. I must thank the panel for making my job so easy because I couldn't have done a better summary than you know what, what individually all of you did. But yes, back to customer. Keep aside you know, time, investment, talent, and energy to experiment and learn. Be adaptive. I think that, that's really what, what, what all of us are saying. Um, so I thought we may have time for uh, audience questions, but we do not. So we'll ca call an end to this. Uh, we are all around. You know. Those of interest want to follow up with any questions, thoughts, comments, what you hated, uh, you're absolutely welcome to do that you know, over the next uh, you know, uh, time that, that we are all here. So uh, thank you very much again, all of you, and thanks for all the insight and the learning. <laughs>